Hi everybody, let's talk about J.S. Bach today. I just woke up and there is no better time of the day to play J.S. Bach music for the viola than in the morning. I heard a long time ago that the great cello player Pablo Casals, who really discovered these pieces, used to play Bach every morning just to kind of get his mind in shape, his body in shape, and to feel good. So that's exactly what I'm doing. We're going to talk about J.S. Bach first thing in the morning. And the piece I've chosen is one that I love called the Courant from the E-flat suite number four. And let's get started right away by talking about our bow strokes. Well, I think about bow strokes very carefully when I'm dealing with music and where to play in the bow. And I want to talk about one thing that's really interesting to me, and that is how do we bow when we're playing the viola? Do we play at the tip? Do we play at the frog? Do we use this? Do we use that? Well, I think about the viola as being kind of a hybrid instrument between a violin and a cello. So in other words, we get the best of the violin and the best of the cello. So when we talk about a violin, we have a lot of bowing that uses this kind of open the door, close the door, open, shut feel. When we play the cello, the cello players play much more with their shoulder and with their arm like this. They do much less of that hinging at the elbow and much more playing like this for more power. And on the viola, I would say that we can do either, one or the other or both. So when I start the piece over here, I like to start down at the frog and I like to use a lot of my upper arm here like this. I always talk about playing in circles. We need to do that. So let's just start that. So you'll see that I play a nice bouncy stroke. You can see that my bow is kind of rounded like this. That helps the sound to really ring. Every time that we play rounded, it will ring. I always tell my students that however you look, it will sound that way. So if my bow is moving in a rounded way, then hopefully my sound will also sound very rounded. So that's my stroke there. You'll also notice that I don't bounce the bow by throwing the bow at the string. Rather, I bounce the bow by starting on the string and lifting. So one of the best exercises that we can do is to start every single bow stroke from on the string and then let the sound lift off the string. Kind of a bite and a release. When I have a sound that's not pure like you just heard, like that, I go back and I practice getting that sound to speak extremely clearly because that is going to be the basis of all of my playing, trying to play with a clear sound and a beautiful ringing tone. So when you look at that beginning, even though it sounds bouncy, really I'm starting every bow stroke from on the string. That is so important. Now, we have a bass line in Bach. We always talk about the bass line in Bach, and that first bass note has to really hit hard. I call that a donkey note. It's kind of stubborn sounding, but I love that sound. So, I love that. And now we're gonna move to the next measure, like so. And Bach does it so beautifully by accelerating the notes. In, in, in other words, going from eighth notes to 16th notes. So if you feel the speed going to the next measure, let's hear that. Like that. So it makes me feel a propelled to the next measure. I love that feeling. Now the next measure is kind of the same as the first, but it's up a fifth. So it's got a higher register. It's a little bit more triumphant. So I try to make it sound even happier. So the first measure sounds like this. And the next third measure sounds. It's kind of more final. It goes to the B flat. 
which is the fifth of the E flat, which is cool. But more than anything, it's higher, and I'm going to play it more triumphantly. So now we have this as our mix. <laughs> Notice I play a lot of open strings. A lot of times our teachers tell us not to play too many open strings, but I'm here to tell you that you should play a lot of open strings. It is the most organic and natural form of our instrument. I heard that from William Primrose. I love the sound of open strings. That's beautiful. That A reedy sound is one of my favorite sounds in the whole world. So you'll notice I'm going to play a lot of open A strings here, a lot of open D strings. Why? Because I like them. And it's the morning and I want to play what I like and I play better when I play things that I really like to do. So remember that. If you want to play your best, play what you want to play. Play what you love to play and then work from there. Now the next thing that we play is something that I love. We have a trill when I trill in Bach, I never want to have a fast kind of Paganini trill. I want to have a very noticeable... The trill is an embellishment. It's an ornament. And so we should always hear the ornament like that. Not, not one of those. So, so even though you can trill a few fewer times, it will sound much more clear if we can hear all the notes in the trill. So let's hear that. Like that, that was like one trill, that wasn't too good. Let's try that again. Like that. Now we have the, tr the triplets coming up. What I love about this piece is the variety. We have 16th notes. We have eighth notes. We have quarter notes. And now we have triplets. I always think of triplets as being rounded. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And I think of eighth notes, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, as being more vertical. And the triplets as kind of rolling along, so like a little ball rolling. And that way I get a lot of variety in my playing, which is exactly, of course, what I'm looking for when I'm playing Bach. So let's listen to that from the beginning, and you'll hear the triplets at the end of, what, of this passage that I'm playing that are going to kind of change the scene and change from a more vertical feel to a more rolling and horizontal feel. That's one that I've never done before, but that's the cool thing about Bach. It kind of happens. Remember, Bach is a canvas. Why do people love to hear others play Bach, especially in auditions and contests and all sorts of things? When you play for someone for the first time, they'll always ask you to play the Bach first. Why? Well, because the Bach is like an, a real canvas. And basically, Bach wrote these beautiful notes down for us in a beautiful pattern, and we as the performer are supposed to be able to make sense of it and to show the audience what our interpretation is. More than any other music that I know, our interpretation becomes so important when we play Bach. When we play other pieces that are standard, let's say the um, Bartok Viola Concerto, <laughs> When we play something like that, well, what, what really ends up happening is that there's a whole bunch of protocol with how you're supposed to play this piece, and then we try to put a little bit of our individual flavor in there, but really there's kind of a standard way of playing most of the big pieces. And even though we can deviate from that, I find that the greatest canvas that we have is J.S. Bach, and we can come up with all sorts of ideas, and it's beautiful to hear one person play completely different than the other. So, that's why we do this. So we're always looking for ideas. We're trying to, to stretch our musical horizons. So let's go back to that and listen to those triplets again. Now we're going to move somewhere else. Now you 
you notice I use that big long open A string, which I think is completely appropriate. Why? Because the next note that we go to, the first one we go to is this. We go to A, and then we go to B flat, which are A, B flat. So my analysis tells me I want those two notes on the same string. Let's listen if they're not on the same string. So now we have a B flat that's super bright, and we have an A that's slightly dark. And so to me, they don't match, but really what we're hearing is bum, bum. We're hearing that leading tone, and we want the leading tone to be as close in timbre or quality of sound as possible to the tonic note or the B flat. So we want the A and the B flat to be really from the same family of notes. So that's why I like the open A string there. Plus, as I said before, I love open strings on the viola. So let's listen to that with the open string again. Have an open mind. Now you'll notice I'm trying to be very, very consistent. Remember, people love consistency. People want things to be consistent. So if we play consistently, the chance of someone understanding our music and loving our music is much higher if we play extremely consistently. If we play kind of scattered that we play one style here, one style there, one way of the 16th notes here, one way of the 16th notes there, people won't understand us. They'll get confused. And the last thing that we want is for our listener to be confused. We are the storytellers and we need our listeners to be able to understand our story. So let's hear what we have up to now. Now the next part with the eighth notes is a place where I do change things because now I feel that these eighth notes are different than the ones before. So I'm going to play them a little bit more legato just to give more variety of course. So now I'm going to start experimenting. How do I want these eighth notes? So I'm just going to play them kind of straight and listen. Listening is so important when we're practicing. We tend to forget that we're so involved with trying to play the right notes, trying to play the right rhythms, trying to be right, that we forget to actually listen to ourselves and A, enjoy, and B, learn. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna play just the notes through. So I notice here that we have different types of notes. In George Orwell's um, Animal Farm book, I think that's what it's called, he says, all animals are created equal, but some are more equal than others. And I've always used that for my viola playing, saying all notes are created equal, but some notes are more equal than others. I love that. So which notes here are more equal than the others? It's kind of the line that I'm gonna find. So listen, I'm gonna twist the line around a little bit. So you'll notice I have a two note um, kind of theme and then I switch it to a three note theme. Let me show you that. So the two note theme goes like this. Those are the two notes. Here they are. Now I'm gonna switch it to three notes. And I think that gives me variety and a little bit of interest. And people are going to say, wow, I like that. But they're not going to know why they like it. But it's because we're kind of twisting the phrase a little bit. Let's listen to that. That was nice, too, with the three notes. 
I always thought that we should always put things in threes when we play box somewhere because that is the Holy Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bach was so religious, and I think he threw that in there just to kind of give that feel to us. So there is my reference to the Holy Trinity when I play the threes. <laughs> Wrong notes, but right idea. So always think through things. That's a great idea. So let's try that. Like so. And now the next part we have triplets and they're tied and we have kind of a line going up. So. Like so. So I just kind of rise and go with the line there. So let's try that again. And we go back to like our original. Like so. You'll notice that that Bach does what I call acceleration. He suddenly puts 16th notes, 8th notes, and triplets really close together, and that kind of ties in the whole thing, and we get to the end of the section. So that's a brilliant way that Bach writes. Everything that he writes is really brilliant. If we look for the brilliant things, we always find more than we even could think about. So let's hear that one again right there. Uh, where is that? Uh, let's see. Notice that I start the trill from the top, and I always kind of show that off, and I don't vibrate too much. Now, let's talk about vibrato. I just thought about that. Do we vibrate when we play Bach? Well, it's early in the morning. Sure, why not? I'm warming up my vibrato. I want my sound to ring. I don't vibrate romantically and crazy, but I love to have vibrato. I want my sound to ring, and the vibrato helps me to make the sound ring. Don't forget, in Baroque music, there was vibrato. People say there was no vibrato, but the vibrato was actually an ornament. So people actually used vibrato back then. And so maybe not as much as we do now, but it is an ornament. So I use it over time to time. Here, a little vibrato like that. So, so there always should be some vibrato, but my reference to the Baroque without the vibrato is on the last note here. So when I play the last note, I'm going to play a very pure B flat over there. Let's see what that sounds like. I just find that to be truly beautiful. Well, it's early in the morning. Boy, I feel stiff with my playing, but the box starting to loosen me up. Sorry about all the mistakes I probably made, but really it's just a process in how I feel about Bach and how I work on it. I hope this video has been really helpful. I hope that you'll approach the Bach and take a look at it and try to think of all the different ways that you can play it and all the different ways that you can have your instrument ring and the beauty that you can make and how wonderful it is that we're able to play our instruments. It's such a blessing to play the viola or the violin or the cello or whatever other instrument that you play. Don't forget that. It is such a blessing that we're able to take this incredible music like the ones written by Bach so many years ago and play it ourselves and own the music to ourselves and be able to get so many things and so much joy out of it. I have such a passion for playing music and I try so hard on this channel to kind of push that passion along to everybody. And so I, I hope that we really can get a lot out of this together. And until I see you the next time, happy practicing.